would like to begin with Stephen Mitchell's rendition of a poem, one of Rilke's sonnets to Orpheus, in which Rilke explores uh, what an object and, uh, by extension, the world truly is. Rilke doesn't take the classic path of Vedanta in which we subject our experience to the scrutiny of reason, but rather he takes the tantric approach, which involves bringing experience closer and closer and closer until we can no longer find any distinction between uh, the object that is known and the one that knows it. And as a result, their shared identity and its attendant joy is revealed. Plump apple, smooth banana, melon, peach, gooseberry. How all this affluence speaks life and death into the mouth. I sense, observe it from a child's transparent features while he tastes. What miracle is happening in your mouth? Instead of words, discoveries flow out from the ripe fruit, astonished to be free. Dare to say what apple truly is. This sweetness that feels thick, dark, dense at first, then exquisitely lifted in your taste grows clarified, awake, luminous, double meaninged, sunny, earthy, real. Oh, knowledge, pleasure, inexhaustible. Dare to say what apple truly is. Do we know what the world truly is? After all, our knowledge of the world appears in and is known by the mind. And just as snow appears orange to one who is wearing orange-tinted goggles, so the world, although in reality it is an exteriorization of the essence of mind, it always appears in accordance with the limitations of the mind with which it is known. And therefore the mind's knowledge of the world can only ever be as good as its knowledge of itself. Therefore, the mind can embark on no greater venture than to explore the nature of itself, its own reality, unless and until the mind explores its own essential nature. It cannot know anything certain about the world. What is the essence of our mind? The essence of something is that part of a thing that cannot be removed or separated from it. Ask yourself the question, 
what element of my mind, and by mind in this context I don't just mean our internal thoughts and feelings, I mean the totality of our experience, including all thinking, feeling, sensing and perceiving. Ask yourself the question, your mind is asking itself the question, what element of myself cannot be removed from me? What aspect of myself remains present throughout all changing experience? Only that qualifies as the essence or essential nature of the mind. As the mind begins to investigate its own essential nature, it begins to travel inwards into itself, discarding layer upon layer of experience that is not essential to it. No thought, feeling, sensation or perception is essential to the mind. These are always appearing and disappearing, but there is one element of the mind that remains continuously present throughout all experience, throughout the three states of waking, dreaming and sleeping. What is that? This process of the mind investigating its own essential reality is similar to a, a wave that sinks into the depths of the ocean and as it does so, it gradually, in most cases, occasionally, suddenly, loses its form and as a result, its limitations. It is what Rumi referred to when he said, flow down and down and down in ever widening rings of being. As the mind sinks downwards or inwards into or towards its own essence, it is in most cases gradually relieved or divested of its limitations. The process Ramana Maharshi referred to as sinking the mind into the heart of awareness. And at the some point when the mind is fully divested of its limitations, its essence, pure knowing or consciousness stands revealed to itself. To give you an analogy for this process, imagine an actor called John Smith who uh, goes to the, his theatre one night to play the role of King Lear. John Smith puts on King Lear's clothes, he adopts King Lear's thoughts and feelings and to all intents and purposes he becomes King Lear without actually ceasing to be John Smith. Uh, John Smith enters so fully into the part of King Lear that when the play comes to an end he forgets to take off King Lear and when his friend comes to congratulate him on his performance backstage he finds him miserable. His friend asks him, why are you so miserable? And King Lear begins to King Lear begins to recount uh, his problems with his uh, kingdom and uh, his relationship with his daughters and his friends. His friend says to him, no, you are not miserable because of your daughters. You are miserable because you have forgotten who you truly are. Who are you really? And King Lear's mind begins to trace its way back. Uh, King Lear starts to uh, describe his thoughts, but his friend says to him, no, your thoughts are not essential to you, you have not, your thoughts are not always present. What are you prior to your thoughts? King Lear describes his feelings, your feelings are not always present. He describes his activities and his relationships. 
these, his friend reminds him, these are not always with you. King Lear begins to struggle to find something that can qualify as himself. At some point he hits a, a layer of existential fear and lack, but his friend points out that even these do not define what he essentially is. A long silence ensues. King Lear opens his eyes and he says, I am John Smith. This simple recognition, not an extraordinary, marvelous enlightenment experience, just the simple recognition, I am John Smith. King Lear, of course, represents the finite mind. John Smith represents its essence, pure consciousness. Although the, it is King Lear that investigates his experience, we cannot say that it is King Lear that recognizes his true nature. Only John Smith knows the experience, I am John Smith. King Lear is an apparent limitation of John Smith's mind, which enables the play to come into existence. But in order to know himself, John Smith does not need to assume the form of King Lear. John Smith knows himself by himself, through himself. As the 13th century Sufi mystic Balayani said, no one sees him except himself. No one reaches him except himself. No one knows him except himself. He knows himself through himself. He reaches himself by means of himself alone. Only he knows him. It is consciousness alone that knows consciousness. Consciousness assumes the form of the mind in order to objectify its potential in the form of manifestation. It needs the activity of mind in order to know manifestation. But in order to know itself, consciousness need not assume the form of mind. It knows itself by itself, through itself, in itself, alone. And it is for this reason that there will never be a science of consciousness. A science of experience, yes. But a science of consciousness, no. If by science we mean an activity of thought and perception, in other words, an activity of mind, it is impossible for mind to know its own essence, although mind is, of course, only made out of that essence. The mind that seeks consciousness is like a character in a movie that travels the world in search of the screen. She never finds the screen in her world and yet everything she finds is made of the screen. Likewise, science, if by science we mean an activity of thought and perception, will never find consciousness in the field of thought and perception. Although everything it finds is made of consciousness, in the form of mind, it will never know consciousness because the mind superimposes its own limitations on everything that it perceives and whatever it perceives, it experiences in accordance with its own limitations. Let me give you an, another analogy that uh, better illustrates the relationship between consciousness and the mind or experience. Consider what happens to your mind when you fall asleep at night and have a dream. 
your mind imagines a world within itself, but it does not perceive that world directly. In order to perceive the dreamed world, our mind must fall asleep to itself and enter into its own imagination in the form of a separate subject of experience, the dreamed subject, from whose point of view the dreamed world is known. From the point of view of the separate subject of experience in the dream, the dreamed world is something separate from itself, made out of something other than itself. And the name that the dreamed subject gives to this other than itself is matter. In other words, our own indivisible minds divides itself into two parts, or seems to divide itself into two parts in a dream. A multiplicity and diversity of objects made out of matter called the world, and a separate subject of experience made out of mind. In other words, The dreamed world made out of matter is what the inside of each of our minds looks like from the perspective of the separate subject of experience in the dream. In other words, the dreamed world is an exteriorization of the insides of our own minds viewed from the point of view of a separate subject of experience in the dream. Now consider the possibility that each of our minds are dreams in the mind of infinite consciousness, the only mind there is. In religious language, God's infinite self-aware being. And unlike each of our minds, which can only have one dream at a time, Consider the possibility that infinite consciousness can have numerous dreams simultaneously and that each of our minds, that is the totality of each of our experiences, is a dream simultaneously precipitated within and made of the only mind that truly is infinite consciousness or God's infinite self-aware being. However, the infinite can only know the infinite. The finite can only be known for the finite, by the finite. So it is consciousness itself who, has, who is dreaming the world within itself. But in order to know that world, it has to localize itself in and as each of our minds. In other words, each of our minds is the activity, not the entity, the only entity present is infinite consciousness, if we can call it an entity. But each of our minds is the activity through which consciousness knows itself as the world. In other words, what we call matter is what the inside of God's mind looks like from the perspective of the finite mind. In other words, what we call the world is not what we see, it is the way we see. And we are free at every moment to see the world in accordance with the limitations of our own mind, or to see the world as an expression and objectivization of the essence of each of our minds. And the world is very obliging. It appears in accordance with 
whatever we believe about it. And I'll leave you with a short story about the painter William Turner, who was returning one evening from a day's painting on Hampstead Heath in North London. And one of the local residents came up to him and said, could I have a look at your painting, Mr. Turner? So Turner shows him the painting, the resident ponders it for a while, and he says, Mr. Turner, I have walked on Hampstead Heath almost every day for the last 40 years, but I have never seen a view like that. To which Turner replies, no, but don't you wish you could? Thank you.